about Detroit sports talk done right? Yeah! If you want it, you got it. It's Detroit sports talk with attitude. It's the knee jerks with Eno and Big Al. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like at this time to introduce to you uh, one of the finest running backs in the United States of America and our number one pick, Barry Sanders. Yes, I say. Let's see what we got. We might not be in your car or on your transistor radio, but we're bringing you the best of Detroit sports past, present, and future. It's time for the Knee Jerks with two guys who know Detroit sports. Here's Greg Eno and Al Beaton. It's Tuesday, April 19th, 2022. It snowed today. In, no, it didn't snow today. It snowed, yes, this, yeah, snowed yesterday in Detroit. I don't know if that means anything, but it also means, though, it's time for the Knee Jerks Detroit Sports Talk of Eno and Big L. That was a really crappy segue, but the best I could do today. So, but anyway, because we've, we've already been dealing with uh, technology uh, headaches today, so what's a screwed up segue to start the show? Anyway, <laughs> this is the Knee Jerks. I am the Big L, the equation L Beaton, longtime Detroit based podcaster and blogger. Joining me, as always, is the man who knows a lot of things about a lot of things, Greg Eno. Greg, how's things? Things are well, Big Al. Uh, don't worry about the clunkiness. I, we, I know what you've been through over the last half hour here. Yeah. And, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> don't, don't worry not about that. I am, I, I am Greg Eno from my WordPress Out of Bounds blog. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at Greg Eno. Follow the knee jerks. On Twitter uh, at the Knee Jerks, so very special uh, episode tonight. We're going to yes. be rejoined uh, for the first time in a number of years by Mike Shoddy, who is. Uh, I'm surprised he even remembers us. To be honest, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no. Actually, I think he's uh, he's Facebook friends with still with both of us over all these years. So, but yeah, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Mike's is is moved uh, up and up to up to better things in the world since we last talked to him. Yes, and he's now with uh, a new enterprise. Well, the enterprise is new, but he's new to it called the 33rd Team. You can follow them on Twitter at the 33rd Team FB, which is a, a he, he, he describes it in our interview, in our interview as a football think tank. And, and yes. once That's you listen a great to what, description, by the way, really. Yeah, is. and once yeah. you listen to all the folks he's got involved in this yeah. 33rd Team, it's going to blow your mind. But we'll talk to Mike in a second in a pre recorded interview. We're going to be talking, of course, about the. The, the Tigers' first week and a half of the season, the NFL draft coming to Detroit. Uh, we've got a little bit of Red Wings as they wind their their season down. Uh, we've got uh, um, more baseball talk. End of the Pistons the season. Run. we got all kinds of stuff to talk yeah. about. Yeah. But, Greg, before we get so to anything gonna else, get, we're gonna, yeah, we got to do the birthday well, game. For I want to stop you so we do the birthday game. You forgot last time. so I, I did forget <laughs> last time. But before we get to any of that stuff, we are going to play the birthday game. And let's go, Maestro. <laughs> We baked you a birthday cake If you get a tummy ache And you moan and groan and woe Don't forget we told you so Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Let's go maestro. What the hell does that mean? You don't say let's go maestro. I say, well, I say, uh, my, I just say maestro. You just say maestro. Say, <laughs> <laughs> this, this podcast is already out of control. <laughs> All right, fire away uh, with the question. <laughs> thanks for pointing out my my uh, my mistakes. Um, this person, Al, was – first of all, I, I must say, everybody knows how we play this game. I give Al a clue or two or three of an individual whose birthday it is today in the sports. And if Al correctly guesses that person within the first two clues, he'll receive – now, you've heard of the Civil War chess set. This is the much less known Vietnam War chess set you'll, you'll receive. Um, oh, so, the, it's, so essentially it's uh... – <laughs> <laughs> the Tet Offensive or, uh, or the or Fall of Saigon or something, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, it's not checkmate. It says, I just took Saigon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> God, okay. The My Lai Massacre. Yeah. Oh, oh, um, oh, 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 Too soon? Too soon? Yeah. Too soon? <laughs> All right. Fire away from um, question. This person, Al, made his name in the world of football. I figured it was appropriate since we're having Mike on tonight. Yeah. This person made his name in the world of football, was a very good player and also a very good coach. Uh, he coached in the NFL, the USFL, and the WFL, and the CFL, if you can imagine such a thing. He coached in all of those leagues, uh, but was a very good and very solid linebacker for the Rams and the Redskins. Um, Rams are uh, Jack Youngblood. 
Oh, you got it. You were close. Oh, yeah. So, I think I know. I have an idea who we're talking about. I was close. You were close. close. Same, same, same era. Probably played in the same team with them. Yeah, I probably got the names confused. I think I know who I'm talking about. But yeah, uh, so I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll save it for the second one. So Yeah. 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 Yep. All right. Oh, good Lord. Since this podcast is spinning out of control, let's, spin, <laughs> <laughs> let's steer into the skid. Greg, and uh, let's go into our interview with uh, Mike Shoddy. If you could, maybe get the introductions, and we'll roll into that. Yeah, I I do the introduction also in the in the in the recording. So I'll just say that Mike Shoddy was a guest of ours uh, in the early days of the Knee Jerks. He's a he's a big time football guy, and um, he's now uh, doing great things at, with the thirty third team. And we'll play the interview with you now for you now that we did with Mike Shoddy. If you've listened to this program for any length of time, and when I say any length of time, I mean at least 10 years, <laughs> you'll remember our next guest, or our guest for tonight, uh, Mike Shoddy. Mike Shoddy was one of, uh, we owe a, a, a debt, by the way, to guys like Mike Shoddy, who was, were, when we first started this program, the Neat Jerks in 2009, and we were, you know, we, we were nobody, nobody knew who the hell we were, and we, we didn't, you know, have a lot of name recognition, so we had a, uh, we were really grateful for anybody who would you know, deem it worthy to come on our program and talk about sports. And Mike Shoddy was one of those people back in the day who was kind enough to uh, to talk about pro fo- usually pro football with us and about the Lions. And and back then, gosh, it was it a was lot Matt of Stafford, Stafford talk, if I remember. <laughs> it was yeah. Matt Stafford's rookie year, for yeah. God's sake, and it was yeah. unbelievable the time that's gone by. And and I'm I'm very happy to to say that Mike is is not only is he with us tonight, but he's doing quite well and is is is. Um, cobbled together quite a following on social media, uh, and he's got a new gig uh, with another enterprise, which we'll get into in a second. But our our aim today is to talk to Michael about uh, the NFL draft and all things football and some Lions stuff in there too. But let's let's say hello once again, finally after many many years, to Mike Shotty. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. It's it's good to be back on, and you know it, it's weird to think that you know back when you're talking about that you were nobody and you couldn't get people to come talk sports. I was nobody and I couldn't find people to let me come talk sports. So, <laughs> uh, I think we have both come up in the world and I know that New Jersey has been going well and you've got a lot of much better guests than a, you know, what 25 year old Mike Shoddy, who is, you know, an unpaid <laughs> freelancer at Bleacher Report at the time. <laughs> well, I think we all were unpaid uh, writers at Bleacher Report at one time or the other. <laughs> of people's resumes actually yeah. i know it's on mine um and uh you know we're, we're thrilled to have you mike and uh and uh let's get right into it uh, mike's uh here to talk about the nfl draft which of course is is coming up rapidly and that's all anybody's been talking about with the lions fan base here is of course as my as al has said the the nfl draft is like the lions fans super bowl for goodness sake but first before we get into that though let's let's set the stage mike tell us what what you're doing who you're with where, where you're writing where that you where you can be found i know your twitter handle by the way is at shoddy by the way s-c-h-o-t-t-e-y but tell us and tell the listeners what the hell you're doing now yeah so uh i took over about two weeks ago as the head of content at the 33rd team uh, if you don't know what the 33rd team is, it is probably just one of the coolest things running right now in sports. Uh, I've been a big fan of it even before I was working for them, even before they were paying me to say that. Uh, but it's run by Mike Tannenbaum, you know, former GM of the Jets, uh, took them to a couple of AFC championship games and knocked out of the playoffs since he left. Uh, then he was EVP of the Dolphins. Uh, the other co-founder is Joe Banner, who, you know, had some pretty great success with the Eagles before going to the Browns. And, we operate both as a website, but also maybe more importantly, as a, as a football think tank. So when you ask yourself, you know, hey, Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl with the Eagles, and then the next season he gets fired, took a year off. Now he's back with the Jaguars. Like, what did he do during that year? Spent a whole lot of time in the 33rd team. Uh, we take uh, the two core functions of our businesses. A, we provide like a really cool place for just the smartest minds in football to come and talk to each other about high level football topics. And so uh, tomorrow night I'm going to be sitting on a zoom call with like Bill Polian and John and Chuck Pagano and, you know, Wade Phillips and multiple, 
you know, former players and former coaches. And, you know, we've got college coaches who joined. We've got guys who, you know, the, the best way to say it is, you know, back in my Bleach Report days, and they were paying me the big bucks to break down film and do all that stuff. You know, I'd, I'd read an article about the 3 4 defense. And I'd interview people and I'd break down the tape and I'd, you know, read a, read a couple books and I'd, you know, really put together a really good, you know, article about the 3 4 defense. If we want to do the third third team, Wade Phillips says, you know, when my dad invented it, here's what he said. And it's just another like crazy level of football knowledge that, that I have access to and that we're, we're providing that access to the world. So the other cool thing that we've done, the other core function website, I'm, I'm you know trying to be brief here because I know we want to get to draft talk, but we've in four years that since we've been up and running, we've placed 14 interns with the NFL. So we are really – teaching the next crop of, you know, if you're with the 33rd team, you're probably either a college baseball player or a college softball player who just loves football and wants to intern for the NFL. And you can't find your way in because your last name isn't whatever. And we're helping people get there. So it's pretty cool to be part of an organization that's placed, you know, 14 so far and, you know, probably the next 14 in the next 12 months or so. This is amazing. I didn't realize this this was even a thing. And the more I hear you talk about it, it's really mind boggling in a good way to hear that there's this. You you call it a football think tank, and I think that's probably the best description you can you can uh, place on it, given what you just said. Uh, if you wanted to follow, by the way, the listeners want to follow the thirty third team on on Twitter. The, the handle is the thirty third team FB. And uh, they've got over 10, they're approaching 11,000 followers right now. So they're very popular. And, uh, uh, so and I'll, like, I'll just, yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Greg. I'll just give one other good example because okay. I'm writing an article for tomorrow that's, you know, who's going to be the number one overall pick. And we, mm-hmm. we, you know, we can segue the heck out of this into the draft talk. Yeah. But, right. you know, when I would write that before, I, I'm just some schmuck. Like, I don't mm-hmm. know. Like, right. I'm just guessing and I'm using the best, you know, football knowledge that I have available. This article tomorrow, I've got quotes from Rick Spielman. I've got quotes from Mike Tannebaum, so that's two former GMs. I've got quotes from Sean King, you know, who's an NFL quarterback mm-hmm. himself. I've got, you know, right. so the access to football knowledge is just like unparalleled. And when I was back at Bleach Report, I remember like doing cartwheels when we finally got someone like Matt Bowen to write for us. Mm-hmm. Now we've got guys like John Pagano who are doing backflips that they get to write for us. It's just a very cool spot to be in. Well, let's let's just real quick. Let's just before we get to the draft, let's just one more time give you an opportunity to tell the listeners why I mean, your football background isn't just as a former writer for Bleacher Report. Let's not marginalize your football background because I know that if you go to your your Twitter handle, you've got a few things that you've done in there in your bio, but just, if you, if you wouldn't mind, Mike, just kind of giving us a quick thumbnail of what the Mike Shoddy football experience has been like uh, uh, over the years. Yeah. So, you know, I played high school football and then, you know, I didn't actually play college because I went right into coaching out of high mm-hmm. school. So I've coached high school and college football. Um, my time in Florida, I spent coaching youth football for just a, a ton of years, uh, growing a football league here. Uh, recently I joined McCandless high school, which is a, a six day high school here in the state of Florida. Uh, I coach offensive line for them. And then I'm also a, you know, an adjunct scout. Uh, you know, I've, I've done scouting work over the years for different organizations, but most recently I'm with the college gridiron showcase, which, uh, what is placed like some of them 50 people on the, you know, week one NFL rosters. You know, it's, it's, we don't like being called the minor league senior bowl, but it's a lot like the minor league senior bowl, the guys who aren't quite senior bowl or mm-hmm. trying game ready. Um, we get that next crop, but we end up, you know, like I said, we end up putting 50 guys in NFL rosters because we've got some good scouts and some great coaches. You know, uh, the, the football knowledge that you've gained and in, in, in the in the stuff that you're doing with 33rd team, obviously, this has got to be a very exciting time of the year for you as well. I mentioned at the top of the interview that Lions fans, well, not just Lions fans, of course, NFL fans in general, really gear themselves up for this this event, which is the draft, which will be held in Detroit, as you know, in two years from now, which is exciting for the folks around here. But the Lions fans especially, it seems like, because the team has not had any success whatsoever in the past, you know, you name it, amount of years, they really – this is their moment. I mean, this is where they, I mean, the, 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 the mock drafts, the, the articles, the, the, the social media chatter, the speculation, as you know, 
has been going on around here in this town for, you know, really essentially since the regular season ended here in December or January. So now it's coming up real quick. And uh, this is a draft, though, which is really, to me, a little bit more interesting than maybe some others because there isn't necessarily that, that you know, consensus number one overall pick, which that everybody knows is going to go number one. There really isn't that kind of a player right now. And to me, it's a draft, Mike, that, that it, it seems like it would be one where NFL teams would be more willing to want to trade down than trade up, if that makes any sense, because of because of that situation. So with everything you've garnered with, with all your, your, your all the people you're plugged into, uh, are you reading it the same? Am I reading it the same way that, that you you guys are or vice versa, that this is just simply not a draft that can be easily um, uh, mocked? Oh, 100%. And I think, uh, you know, in years where there's not the Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck types, we can all sort of start to agree that there's like two or three players who are above the crop or the Miles Garrett's of the world or the, you know, Jadavian Clowney's of the world. Take your pick, you know, whether it's an offensive lineman or a, a you know, a defensive end or whether it's a stand-up rush linebacker. You know, there's always the couple of guys that we can all agree are at the top of that class. And then, you know, it's just, you know, one man's trash, another man's treasure, beauty's in the eye of the beholder who – gets the nod and, and there can be a little bit of drama, but right now it's like, you know, so maybe Aiden Hutchinson is the top guy off the board, but there might be 10 other teams that don't even have him on their board. Like this is just, it's not, you know, is this guy a great player? It's if he's not the perfect fit for every single team or every single roster, there might be teams that, you know, if they're trading up for number one, you might think, oh, they're, they're trying to get up to number one or number two for Aiden Hutchinson. No, they don't even want him. And the same is true for guys like Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, Ike Mekwanu, uh, Evan Neal. There's just so much variance, not just in, like, what position do you need best or do you rank this guy, you know, 99 and this guy 98. It's like there are guys that some teams are going to have 99, 98, and other teams are going to have it, like, in the 70s on their draft boards, uh, you know, in terms of overall rating. And they – it's just so crazy to think, and unless you're in those rooms, it's impossible to know exactly what they're thinking. And, and if you even just look at like some of the collections, like you always see the news articles around this time of year, they're like a collection of rumors. And you'll see things like Charles Cross is in the discussion for the number one pick. 15 teams don't have Charles Cross as a first round prospect, you know, and those things aren't contradictory. Like, I don't think it's smoke screens. I don't think that there's, you know, Albert Breer is getting, like, complete BS information versus, you know, Tony Pauline. I think it's just if when you talk to 10 different teams, you get 10 different, vastly different answers. And everyone is, 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 I think, in good faith this year. And I'll bring you back, and I don't want to spend too long on this, but last year we had a very shallow draft class because of COVID. And you had a lot of – instances where, and I'll use the Lions as a really good example. So if you go back to the last season, because of COVID, we had a very shallow draft class because a lot of guys opted out and were able to opt into this draft class or even into next year's draft class based on, you know, their, their eligibility. So last year, because of COVID, you had a shallow draft class and you had a need for NFL teams to have guys in a building. So, the wrinkle last season was the undrafted free agents who were in the building around got a lot of opportunities for teams like the Lions, the, the, the AJ Parkers of the world got opportunities to shine with teams like the Lions because when injuries happened, you couldn't go to the street for a free agent. So long story short, because of COVID, I think what we're having is last year was a shallow class. This year is a, you know, very deep, but not as top heavy class. And I think next year is when we're going to get some of the top heavy people. And and so as you're looking at some of these top prospects, I think a lot of NFL teams are correctly ascribing the fact that they might not be that much better than guys that you can get in the fifth, sixth round because this class is just so deep. We're talking with Mike Shoddy of uh, the 33rd team. Uh, you can follow that uh, that enterprise on Twitter and follow him on Twitter, at Shoddy. You listen to the Knee Jerks. I'm Greg. You know, from my WordPress out of on blog, and Big Al Albeat is with us as well. We'll get Big Al involved in a second. But is this a draft, Mike, that that, that truly teams are going to be drafting for, for need as opposed to, you know, you always hear that, 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 
cliche, well, let's just draft the best player available. But is this is this the kind of a draft? I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is this is the kind of a draft where teams may be focusing more on need than anything else. Is that is that accurate? I think possibly. I think where need versus the board comes into play is when you're going to have runs. Because I think, again, just look at the wide receiver position. There are probably five to six wide receivers who've got, you know, mid first to early second round grades and the, the possible permutations, whatever, you know, five or six with the exclamation point next to it. That's probably how many different ways, different scouts and different NFL decision makers have those guys ranked because there's no consensus on whether you take Jameson Williams or, you know, Christian Watson (laughs) first, you know, first out of that bunch. And so when you start to see the runs happen, it's, I think that's where teams will start to, you know, trigger some things and say, no, I need to trade up because I can get, you know, the speedy slot guy later. But I know for a fact there's only like five of those guys in the draft class and none of them are the guy that I want in the first round. So that's where I trade up and that's where I start going. Need, sure, but also, hey, I want the best available of this type of player. A big uh, thing going on here in Detroit discussion is positional value when it comes to the top of the draft. Uh, obviously, it's, for the most part, the highest paid positions in football anymore are becoming quarterback, uh, edge rusher. There's between the contract size and that fifth-year contract option. When people talk about maybe taking a safety at second overall, is that a bad decision basically because of the financials, or should it even make a difference? And again, this is where I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder. If you yeah. think you are getting Troy Palomalu, mm-hmm. you take him second overall. You know, how much how much last season did we talk about off ball linebackers right. aren't valuable, so you don't take a player like Micah Parsons <laughs> rating defensive mm-hmm. rookie of the year. You know, how many times have we heard that? I think yeah. right now the game of football is in, in flux a little bit and we're asking safeties to do more and more and there's fewer and fewer of them who can do those things. Kyle Hamilton's one of those guys. But then yeah. again, I know I know teams that don't have Kyle Hamilton in their top twenty players. Mm-hmm. So it all depends, I think, less on positional value right now yeah. because we, we, see the, we see the wide receiver market exploding. Right. And five years ago, we didn't take wide receivers this high either, so, mm-hmm. or we didn't pay receivers this much. So I think it's less about positional value and more do you value that player so highly that you're willing to go on a limb and say, we'll take that. You know, Heck, it can be Tyler Lindenbaum at center, or it can be mm-hmm. you know, one of the tight ends. If you like them that much, take them, because this draft class is so in flux right now, and the NFL game is so in flux right now that I think you are handcuffing yourself if you're sitting there like, do I take the, the fourth defensive end, or do I mm-hmm. take this player that I think is an all-pro? You take the all-pro. Right. Lions fans are obviously very excited about the prospects of, of Aiden Hutchinson, and, and I know that, that you, you think he may go number one. If he's there, I know there's been a little bit of chatter that the Jags might like Tra- Trayvon Walker. If he's there, Mike, Hutchinson, if Hutchinson's there, is this a no-brainer for the Lions? Well, I believe maize and blue, so <laughs> you know, probably uh, it would be if I was him. There are problems with Aiden Hutchinson, though. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson is smaller than you want him to be. Right. Aiden Hutchinson does not have the natural bend that you want out of a top tier pass rusher. He is not in any way, shape, or form Miles Garrett. Like right. he's not that dude. He's not Javian Clowney. He's not a freak athlete. He's just a very, very good football player. Is he a and Pro Bowler? Think, could he be a Pro Bowler though? In the NFL? I think he could. I think his highest end is a guy who flirts with the All Pro team and is a is a pretty consistent Pro Bowler because he's going to be a fan favorite. He's going to be someone that that fans like and vote for. Mm-hmm. But I don't think he's a Hall of Famer. And yeah. that's that's like I love him to pieces, and I don't think right. he's a Hall of Famer. And he might prove me wrong. He might be the next T.J. Watt in that mold, but I don't see it. And I think he's a very very good player. I think he's the best defensive end. I would take him over Walker. I'd take him over Thibodeau, but I don't think. And that's where this draft class is weird. He's just not the Miles Garrett that you would love to see from a pass rushing standpoint at the top of the class. There was some scuttlebutt, Mike, about um, Dan Campbell supposedly, Coach Dan Campbell, the line supposedly leaking out, or or it was leaked out that he Campbell wasn't enamored with Thibodeau. Is that really the case? I mean, people, teams play things so close to the chest, or is that just some smoke to to kind of throw things throw things off by by, by that even being leaked out? 
I have no idea what's happening inside Allen Park, but mm-hmm. I do know that around the league, there are people who've said similar things about Kayvon Thibodeau. And I, I don't think, for better or for worse, I don't know the, I don't know the young man myself, but I think for better or for worse, there are lots of people around the game of football who think that Kayvon Thibodeau is not a great teammate, who think that Kayvon Thibodeau is all about Kayvon Thibodeau, mm-hmm. and you can get some great play out of him but I, I think there are some things you can't ask him to do, and I don't think he's highly coachable. Again, this is just stuff that I'm hearing right. from around. Right. And, you know, the old scouting adage is that you don't talk to the head coach, you talk to the equipment guy, or you talk to the, the interns, you talk to the trainers, because you have to treat the head coach well. You know, the cave mm-hmm. on Thibodeau's yeah. world will always treat the, the head coach right. well. It's right. how they treat the, the quote-unquote little people. Mm-hmm. And... Again, I don't have any direct information, but what I'm hearing is that Kevin Thibodeau does not necessarily treat those people the best that he feels above. And if you're splitting hairs, and again, I'm not saying this is gospel truth, but if you're right. splitting hairs and, and you're Dan Campbell and you actually feel that way or you've seen it or you've heard it or your your teammates or people on your staff have told you that, that's that's when you take an Aiden Hutchinson, or that's when you take a Trayvon Walker, because yeah. there are no character concerns. A little safer, a little safer, maybe. Yeah, we're uh, we're wrapping things up with Mike Shoddy. You can follow him at Shoddy on Twitter and also at thirty third f thirty uh, third team FB, uh, where he's the content uh, manager there. Let's bring Big Al in for one more. Big Al, what you got for Mike Shoddy? Quarterbacks, obviously a big topic here in Detroit. If you're going to take a quarterback, you might as well take him at two if you like him that much, because obviously there might be a few decent quarterbacks when they pick a 32 or even 34. A quarterback needy team, do you reach on a quarterback in the first round? Is it something that the Lions should think about? Again, beauty's in the eye of the holder. So mm-hmm. I don't think you reach for a quarterback, but if that quarterback is on your board at a commensurate spot, I think you go grab him. Yeah. You know, can I see the argument from Malik Willis at? I can't, but I can at least understand where some teams might. Um, I'm a huge Desmond Ritter fan, and I would love to grab Desmond Ritter in the middle of the first round, uh, whether that's a trade down or a trade up, because uh, I don't think he's going to be around at 32, but I might be wrong there because, mm-hmm. you know, I don't love Kenny Pickett that much. But I've got former NFL GM telling me that Kenny Pickett's the best thing since sliced blood, bread. Um, I think where 32 comes into play is not necessarily just for the Lions, but for teams trying to jockey for that fifth year option. Right. And so I think actually, as much as we talk about trading down from number two, I think if the Lions aren't an average quarterbacks who are left at 32, someone is. And mm-hmm. so I think the trade down from 32 is actually probably a lot more likely or a team trying to leapfrog the Lions because they think the Lions are going to go get a, you know, a, a Matt Coral right. and teams are going to try to leapfrog the Lions to go do that. Because mm-hmm. I think if the Lions want a quarterback and he's available at 32, you have to take him there because there's your fifth year option. And that's so right. valuable to have that quarterback on a rookie contract for an extra year. But honestly, like, I don't love any of them that much. I mean, mm-hmm. Desmond Ritter is my guy. I've loved him forever. I still am not sold on him as like a perennial you know, next best case scenario. I think what can happen to him is kind of what happened with Patrick Mahomes, where he kind of came out of nowhere and had a much better NFL career than a, than a college career, but he's not right. Patrick Mahomes. He's mm-hmm. not that, you know, perennial all pro best quarterback in the league dude. Um, but again, I'm, I'm one opinion. And if you've got 32 NFL decision makers with opinions and all of their scouts who have their opinions, you're going to have a bunch of people who think completely opposite ways. And this is a draft class that's that's wide enough where you can see, you know, I don't think a single quarterback deserves to like locks rock solid be taken in the first round. Mm -hmm. But you know, that quote unquote anonymous scout told Peter King this week that five quarterbacks are probably going to go in the first round. And that's just where the NFL is so crazy right now because Mm -hmm. Do all those guys deserve to go in the first? Maybe, maybe not. It doesn't change the fact that it only takes one team to start that run on quarterbacks. And once that starts, it probably is going to end up finishing with five or six of those guys being taken in the first 40 picks. Well, we'll see how it all shakes out. Mike Shoddy, uh, thanks for joining us. And to think, Greg, we knew Mike Shoddy when he was a lowly uh, Bleacher Report writer who I don't even think was getting paid at the time. Right. You know, so and look at him now. You know, right. running around with movers and shakers of the NFL. Oh, we when he started listing all those folks that were involved yeah. in that thirty third team, I'm like, wow, that's that's some pretty heavy heavy mm-hmm. hitters in there. Yeah, it's, um, 
it's uh, it's it's one. It's pretty impressive, but also you, you got to give them credit for the hustle. You know, you, yeah, well, yeah, you know, you know and because it, it's something that, you know, he, you know, for especially the, to get involved in the stuff he has, but to have not played above high school says volumes. Because right. usually you see guys like that, you know, they make their contacts when they're playing in college or even pros or stuff like that. And here is Mike. Uh, you know, here's Mike, who's, uh, you know, I mean, I brought up his mock draft. I brought up the mock drafts and things they have. Oh, no, that, that website, the um, uh Oh, the 33rd team is definitely worth looking at. There's a lot of interesting draft information, and uh, uh, this, I'll just put it this way. Mike has made himself a nice little career in the uh, NFL draft industrial complex. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yes. All right. Uh, with that, Greg, why don't you give me the second clue of the birthday game? Okay. Uh, made his name in football, as I said, born in the state in 1936. I didn't give you that clue. He was born in 1936. He coached in the NFL. The USFL, the WFL, and the CFL, believe it or not. Uh, he is a former l- a linebacker who played for George Allen twice, once with the Rams and once with the Redskins. Uh, made his NF- NFL coaching uh, debut with the Chicago Bears and eventually coached the Redskins as well. All right, I had to think about this just for a sec. I'm trying to remember, you know, especially the George Allen uh the George Allen era Redskins, you know, and they and the their uh, the, the over the hill gang with, with right. the name of that defense. Or, no, that right. was they were the like the first team that would uh, said screw them draft picks. Let's just get productive right. veteran players. And I think Jack Pardee was one of those types of players. Oh, you got it, Jack yes. Pardee, indeed. Good yeah. job. Jack yeah. died in 2013, but mm-hmm. he is. I didn't know he coached in all those leagues. I didn't but, either. Um, no. Uh, Jack was a, and he also coached in college. I think on, I think on top of that, he coached in college, or did he? Uh, did, 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 no, I'm sorry, I take that back. He did not coach in college, but he uh, did. He coached for the uh, the Redskins, the Bears, the, the Houston Gamblers of the USFL. He coached for the Florida Blazers in the WFL. He coached for the Oilers, of course. Yeah. Uh, he coached uh, for a team called the Birmingham Barracudas. I'm not sure what league that was in. Yeah. But, um, yeah, uh, Jack Party um, uh, went to Texas A&M and was a, a linebacker for 17 seasons, yeah. from 1957 to 73, mm-hmm. and uh, was a very good very good linebacker, by the way. But, uh, anyway, yeah, That's good job. That's a football so you, lifer. You received, you received, yes, he is, and mm-hmm. he, he was, and you received the Vietnam War chess set. Good job. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, good lord! Anyway, uh, we have a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. Uh, I figure we'll we'll start with the Lions because the really only really topic we have, considering the draft is about ten days away, and we covered a lot of that with Mike as to the overall velocity with the draft, how the draft's going to go down. Uh, so really, the only hot t- and I don't want to talk any more about draft picks and who the Lions might draft. That's for for after the draft because I'm Greg. I don't know about you, but I'm drafted out. There's yeah. the the I don't I every year is the uh, as I call it, as I just call it the the NFL draft industrial complex has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger to where it just overwhelms the news cycle. So I think what got kind of lost on, in all this was not the actual announcement that the Lions are going to host a draft in a couple of years. I think what kind of flew under the radar, Greg, was Roger Goodell was in town. Uh, they had that little party downtown Detroit to. Celebrate the, you know, because that's what Detroit does. They do dumb stuff like this. But uh, not the having the draft, but to celebrate getting the draft, they throw a party. And Roger Goodell made a short speech. And during this event, uh, Goodell claimed that the 2024 NFL draft will generate $200 million in revenue. And he also added the bigger impact will be in exposure and visibility. <laughs> One, as former writers, you know, uh, who used to get hit on by people all the time, I know you probably got the same pitch that I did. I can't pay you money, but I can pay you an exposure. I can pay I, you right. get all kinds of availability. I can, you'll get all kinds right. of visibility. Uh, and I remember right, going back, right, right. I got enough visibility with the sites I'm running for. Pay me if you want it's, Want my opinion on something. Right. So, one, I thought that was complete BS, you know, the old exposure and visibility. It's freaking Detroit. It's a big league market with four pro teams. They get plenty of exposure. 
But what really gets me, though, Greg, and this also kind of subject also falls into the sort of thing you hear when uh, teams are, want to uh, build a new stadium or they want to, they, or if, t- I mean, if teams want anything from a m- municipality, you hear you start getting these numbers thrown out there. Well, if this happens, it's going to bring in X amount of revenue. The thing is, though, Goodell said this number, $200 million. And he, who says? On, on what's the research? What numbers do you have to tell tell us that you're going to that this is the kind of money that's going to come in? And for that matter, how much are, are this, is the city of Detroit and the Lions going to spend in order to bring in that revenue? You know, they're kind of saying, oh yeah, it's just magically going to appear. But think about the infrastructure that's going to be needed. Think about the uh, uh, people who are going to need to be hired to work. Blah blah blah. Uh, you know, just. Everything that's involved of having a big event. And when they start throwing numbers like $200 million, that sounds an awful lot like bullshit to me. I don't know about you, but claiming that, uh, uh, was it a three-day draft? It'll probably, you know, it'll probably end up being most of a week-long event here in the city. But $200 million is going to be held somewhere downtown Detroit. But they're talking about Hart Plaza and obviously Ford Field area. When they start gener- saying numbers like this, and these seem pretty outrageous, if you ask me, especially in a city like Detroit that isn't a tourist destination like in Vegas or in Nashville or in Miami, I, I just find this, this is the sort of stuff that just drives me nuts when it comes to the pro sports, when they claim, if you do this for us, we'll bring in this kind of money, when they literally, I, if you ask me, are pulling these numbers out of their asses that they have no legitimate backing as to what they'll say other than maybe hiring someone probably the out of the uh, chamber of commerce or something to say oh yeah you'll bring in that much I'll, I'll no problem so it's it's a I just think it's a crack when they when they say giant events like this are going to ignite a, a city's economy when year after years of research from actual economists and People who do this for a living say these numbers are always, always, always inflated. Well, you know, there's no corporate sponsors, although I'm sure there will be. That's I mean, another that point. There's no, there's no one. They've, they've said nothing about what, what, cor- how, how this is going to be involved corporation wise. You were right on there. But they, I'm about having said that, I'm sure they will. But yeah, as but of right how now, much they, they, they how much are they going to get involved financially? Exactly. Yeah, they weren't able to. They weren't. That was the one thing they weren't able to, to really uh, to say right. with any sort of truthfulness when they when they made the announcement. I mean, look, Detroit is for whatever reason. For, well, I shouldn't say for. I, should, I know what the reason is. Has long have has long held a has had an inferiority complex. Bingo. I mean, they just have the whole the whole city has whether it's the sports fans. The city itself, um, you know, has Detroit always versus been everybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And so, I mean, it's and, and it's you mentioned it's not a it's you're right. It's not a tourist destination. That's why when they did get the, the two Super Bowls in here, uh, it was a big deal, as it should be. I mean, the Super yeah. Bowl is a big deal for sure. You know, being a, a, a northern climate doesn't help and, mm-hmm. and so forth uh, as far as luring people here at that time of the year. Um, but. The thing that always, whenever I, I cringe a little bit when, when they make these announcements, not that I'm against the, the draft coming to Detroit. Right. Oh, know, yeah. More yeah. power to, you know, more power to the city and so forth. But what, the reason I, I cringe is, Al, is because, I, you know, I, I've worked in Detroit. I've, I've worked in Detroit for a number of years and, and mm-hmm. I'm in, in the downtown area. But to get to that, but to get to my job for my, my suburb, to get to my downtown job, I have to drive through some very un, uh, unflattering looking neighborhoods. And it always bothers me that the city's, uh, and I, I will admit that the city's downtown vibe has mm. definitely improved over the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, I mean, it really has. I'm, yeah, I'm downtown really itself, at least the Foxtown yeah. area and Greektown well, the, the, and Corktown. The yeah, there are a lot of nice right, areas. Right. The whole. The whole Woodward corridor, you can make yeah. fun, of, fun of the the little train that goes up and down Woodward all you want. But the I mean, Q line, really, the, I mean, the train to nowhere, much like the uh, people mover. People, <laughs> I mean, you can, but uh, that's all well and good. And, and they've done a pretty good job of, of revitalizing that, that area, whether you 
talking about Greek Town or by Hart Plaza or you know Campus Marshall, whatever we want to talk about. But the cringy part to me is where why why can't we put this money into the neighborhoods? Yeah. Why can't we brighten up some of the neighborhoods? Why can't we? Why can't why, why can't some of this? And and people keep getting elected as mayor who don't do this, by the way. And it's, it's been going on for way before Mike Duggan. Mm-hmm. Is why can't they? Why can't some of this money find its? Why can't it start downtown and and work its way out? Yeah. I never see anything. It's almost like there's a force field that stops some of this money from from getting spent beyond, you know. The, beyond the, the museum district, I mean, yeah. uh, once we get past Wayne State and the museum district, where are we? Where am I seeing all this money? That, where's the investment? I guess, and a yeah. lot of investment, of course, has, has come from private or from celebrities, or from from people from people in the uh, athletes or you know, who've pumped money into neighborhoods and put put money into parks and have tried to do something with the youth, and the, and that's all well and good, but I still see. You know, homes that are dilapidated and and and, mm-hmm. and, um, and 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 at the very least should be, of course, demolished. I know they've been, and I know that they've done a a, a better job, at least in recent years, in, in demolishing some of these uh, uh, old uh, 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 buildings. But I just don't know at what point does some of this money find its way to people who don't live and work downtown, which yeah. is a lot, a lot of which are which are a lot of Detroiters yeah. who don't work uh downtown and don't can't take advantage of some of those amenities. yeah how about building some grocery stores and freaking destroy right. so people don't have to go to the goddamn suburbs to do their shopping things like that right you know right. it's yeah, yeah you that, make that, a great point because uh you think about you know if you live if, if you live in this area if you if you want to not impress somebody take that drive from metro airport down 94 to downtown detroit it right. is depressing <laughs> more than anything. Oh, there's the big Uniroyal tire is about the most ex- about the nicest thing you'll see. The, uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, the uh, the giant Uniroyal tire was a Ferris wheel at the 1964 World's Fair. And after the World's Fair, it got moved right next to I-94, about halfway between Detroit and the airport, to become this giant, essentially billboard tire for you know advertisement for Uniroyal. And that's about the only decent thing you might run across on that drive to Detroit, because the drive to Detroit on 94 or 75 or 696 or 96, you're right, it's, there's there's nothing to see. It's, it's really depressing at times. You know, you nailed it. That, that The drive into Detroit is not good. It's not, it does not make a good first impression. And when you bring up that revenue as a who's going to see it, you're right. They say, oh, yeah, we're bringing $200 million of revenue into town, if you believe it. How is that going to you, – you make a great point is who sees that money? Does that mean that Rocket Mortgage is sponsoring this and is going to see a bunch of this coming back somehow? Or is it the, – or the Illich, uh, or Illich Holdings is going to see this money? Or is it going to uh, – or are they talking about restaurants and bars and businesses or whatever? Or are they talking about in, in temporary salaries because they're going to pay people 15 bucks an hour to be a uh, host and security or something? You know, it's – there are so many, I guess uh, – uh, it just, it, I think you nail it in that. I think when it comes to Detroit, we when these things get ha- when these things come to town, this city acts like they're doing us a huge favor. Oh, you're coming to Detroit? Thank you. We're ignore. Yeah, again, as you said, it's the uh, the inferiority complex this area has had for decades, and you know, at least going back 50, 60 years. And this area acts like the NFL is doing them such a huge favor in coming to Detroit when I'm sure the NFL has done the math and has done the research and knows if they're going to come to Detroit, they're going to make a shit ton of cash of their own. So, you're right. You, I think you really nail it when you, when you say this area acts like it has such an inferiority complex, like they don't deserve to have the events like this. And when they do, they bend over backwards. And sometimes I think they give away too much in tax breaks and, and giving them leeway what they can do just to have them here. And I, I, that, all, that has always bothered me about this area. 
Well, I mean, and, and the things that I just outlined are not unique to Detroit. I mean, yeah. a lot of major cities have, have scenarios. Rust Belt where cities got, specifically, right. I think, yeah. Yeah, where, where you've got a really nice downtown and you've got some really nice suburbs, frankly. Yeah. Like Detroit has. Mm-hmm. But you don't have that that that, 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 that space. We're not Chicago, in other words. Between downtown <laughs> and between the, the city limits, if you will. Yeah. That's where things are. Or a mess. Sketchy. And, and but it's, like, yeah. it's not unique to Detroit. I'm right. not suggesting that Detroit is the only, but but I just don't. I, I've always felt like there hasn't been enough emphasis by the by the uh, the administrations that have been in that city to do anything beyond. You know, once like I say, once you get past the museum district and, and everything just changes almost like just like that. Yeah. And um, so I, I just hope that I know it's another discussion, but I, I just hope that some of this money, I I don't know. There's never an accounting. Al, you're right. There's never mm-hmm. an accounting that says, Perfect. OK, bingo, bingo. You can throw these, you can throw these, you know, you can throw these dollar figures around like Goodell did and and the, and the 200 million dollars and, and whether 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 that number is like you said, completely fabricated or if there's some truth to it you can do that but there's never an accounting there's never once everybody leaves town once the event is over once everybody from the nfl mm-hmm. packs with bags and goes back home and 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 they've cleaned up the streets and swept away all the confetti okay now let's where's the money going you, yeah. you, you told you told us there's gonna be 200 million dollars coming in first of all how much money did come in number one mm-hmm. number two what, what how's that being parsed out and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of it goes right into of course to the businesses of course as it should i mean those that's fair and square the the, the businesses that are providing the services and the food and the drink and the and the play and everything of course they should be paid but what but there's got there's, when when goodell says 200 million dollars is going to be pumped into the economy uh, I'd just like to see. Uh, give me, a, give me a break. Give me, a, give me line items. Give me, give give me, me a, break a Google break. spreadsheet for Christ's sake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, show <laughs> me. I mean, you know, I, 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 sometimes I think that, that nobody bothers to ask that question because nobody mm. thinks to ask that question. They, right. they just, they, they, the, they, the, the event comes and goes, and uh, then we move on. Nobody ever yeah. talks about. Gee whiz, you know, six months later, nobody ever says. You know, whatever happened to all that money that came in when we had the NFL draft here? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, where's that being allocated? Are we, are we going to put some into the inner city? Yeah. Are we going to do something like you mentioned, supermarkets? Are we going to do something to clean up a, a, a blight? Yeah. What are we going to do here? Yeah. And uh, nobody ever seems to whatever, ask those questions, and I, th- I think they're fair questions, uh, especially after things have died down and all the hoopla is over with. Okay, yeah. now let's let's get out our calculators and our and our pencils from our behind our ear and let's. Let's figure out what the hell we did here. Exactly, because uh, also I remember I remember the uh, the Super Bowl at the Silverdome out in Pontiac, and I think all of Pontiac ultimately got out of that was some was some abandoned buildings that got painted to look pretty. I think that was about it that was like a city like Pontiac saw out of out of the damn Super Bowl because the whole damn everything else was essentially taking part in, in t- taking place in Detroit. But yeah, it's I think you nailed it. If there, there's I wish there was an accounting. Like, do we know how much? Money is being spent, and then they get back, for example, remember when Formula One had to race on the streets of Detroit there for a good part of the 80s? Or how much? Or what's the breakdown of the, of the Belle Isle Grand Prix when IndyCar is in town? Things like that. You know, it's uh, – I, mean, I love the city of Detroit. I, I mean, I love this area, but sometimes this, this place just feels so uh, – that, that – I wish they had a little more hubris around here. I guess I would put it that way. You know, don't, don't act like they're doing you a favor. I guess that's the best way to put it. All right. Yeah. All right. With that, uh, we need to move on. I was going to say we need to ask the, the third question of the birthday game, but I already got the question right. So I'm I, I'm too busy uh, bombing Laos right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, we really are going down a dark Laos. hole. With that. That, that's your fault, Greg. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a lot of uh, Tiger stuff to talk about, Greg, so let's get to it. Uh, I guess we could start with the injuries, as that really seems to be the big topic over the past week or so. And overwhelmed, I guess you could say that at the very least, the team has been hit pretty severely. Uh, and who, it's and the guess the question is, is it just bad luck, or could the shortened spring training have something to do with it? But several players are still out due to the spring training injuries. So Riley Green, Andrew Chafin, Jose Cisnero, I believe, was coming back today. Uh, Kyle Funkhauser, Derek Hill, they're all still 
in various stages of rehab right now. Then over the past week, you could add two more to the list. Uh, Casey Mize, the Tigers' prize prospect. Well, he's not a prospect anymore, but he, they're hoped to be ace of the future. He has an elbow strain that won't require surgery. That came out today. But he will miss, quote, unquote, with, uh, all they're saying is a few weeks. I would not be surprised if he misses a month, something like that. Uh, Matt Manning, right the di- a couple days after Mize went down, Matt Manning left his start after two innings with what they called shoulder discomfort. Uh, they're saying, uh, A.J. Hinn said it's not that serious. It was more precautionary. He probably could have pitched through it, but he will likely miss his next start. Uh, also, Javi Baez is on a 10-day DL with a I, pardon me, not DL, IL, with a swollen thumb. And what's funny, he hurt that thumb celebrating his game-winning hit on opening day. And it had, and it had just gotten worse over the past week. Uh, Robbie Grossman has been day-to-day with a sore groin. And let's not even forget, Greg, which I think people do, Spencer Turnbull and Jake Rogers, both expected to be big contributors this year, will likely miss all, most of, if not all, of this year. I think Rogers is not coming back this year. and They'll be lucky if Turnbull comes back maybe in August or September. So this team has really gone through the ringer injury-wise, and the schedule has done them no favors either. At least they caught a break with the rain out on Sunday, so at least that gave them some time to get their pitching in order. But when you see a situation like this, this is why I was not jumping on the this team is going to compete is going to make the playoff bandwagon because baseball can be it only takes a couple big injuries and your entire season can be wrapped on the pitching staff and we've seen that with Casey Mize for example you could argue Greg that the Tigers two best pitchers Turnbull and Mize are not in a rotation right now so uh, you know it, 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 there's no reason to panic obviously it's way early in the season. I guess right. what you could just hope for right now is that they'll continue to play around 500. I guess, uh, you know, you, they can't win it all right now. They can't make the playoffs right now, but they could definitely fall out of the playoff pitcher with a bad April. So A.J. Hinch does have his work cut out for him, but it's still too early to panic. But there is reason for concern. Well, I mean, may as well get these things out of the way early. I mean, that's yeah. that's my my take on it. Um, these, you know, the shortened spring training, the, the 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 fact that these young arms are just it seems like everybody's going down multiple times with potential Tommy John situations yes. or, or some sort of. Uh, yeah, how many times did you see that on social media, Greg? When they said, "Oh my God, elbow strain, always going to have Tommy John." Yeah, and a lot of times. But it's usually true, it's, I mean, it's forearm strain is the bad one. That's if they say forearm yeah. strain, then because right. that was Spencer Turnbull, and it's forearm strain, then you're in trouble. So anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. No, 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 no. I mean, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's not it's not a great way to start things out, but you know, it is I think kind of a, a, a byproduct of of the shortened spring training and the fact that you know um, maybe we are underestimating the value of having a longer spring training, frankly, mm-hmm. when we see some of these injuries uh, occur. I mean, you're, you're going, of course, you're going from Florida's heat to, you know, the cold of Michigan, and I understand that, too. Uh, they played the first six games at home, so they played, you know, a number of games in, in chilly weather and so forth. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it's a long season. There's plenty of time for these guys to, to get healthy. Chafin, the, the lefty reliever, should be coming back pretty soon. Um, you know, he's been hurt. Um, he should be back pretty soon, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, Grossman, you know, uh, you mentioned Baez, but I think a lot of the stuff is 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 kind of uh, annoying. Injuries are kind of uh, I don't know if they're really necessarily um, stuff that's going to put anybody out for any length of time. Yeah, at least um, so far, right? Right. So I, you know, it's I, it's not to me. It's not it's not crucial. Right now, but I mean, yeah, you know, you don't like to see guys drop like this, but mm-hmm. um, you know, it just goes to show you, Al, that, that, that that's why you know mm-hmm. drafting a pitcher uh, that high is always fraught with this kind of potential, if, if disappointment, if nothing else, because when you have a uh, bring a kid up like 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 Mize and like Manning, who, who these guys are drafted really really high, and it doesn't, you know, it just 
it, it seems like they get hurt more often than the position players do, mm-hmm. and their injuries are usually put them out for a quite a, a long period of time, especially if you're talking Tommy John. So it, that's the danger of drafting mm-hmm. a kid that high as a pitcher. And I know it's tempting when you know he's he checks off all the boxes on your list as a, as a scout, and you know he could be indeed the next Justin Verlander, but. Um, that's the that's the negative to it is that is that these guys can, you know, like Manning with the discomfort the other day, and uh, you know, Mize of course, it, it's it, it's just a little scary. I mean, that, that's it, it's high risk, high reward with these guys. I mean, that's just mm-hmm. the way it is. It's it's just it's, it's the way that the the, the pitching mechanics and, and the way that the, the, these kids throw. Um, and you're talking, you know, they're throwing like that at, at, in, in the, at the high school level. Many times they're drafted right out of high school, uh, or at the very least, maybe after a year of college. And they're they're still drafted as teenagers, essentially, and maybe 19, mm-hmm. maybe 20. But usually they're drafted as teenagers. Mm-hmm. And you know, it uh, that kind of the human arm, unfortunately, was not meant to be to to be used that way. Let's face mm-hmm. it. And yeah. so. Really, when you look at a guy like Justin Verlander, who I mentioned a few moments ago, who, who himself, of course, had Tommy John, and, and you see, see how he's bounced back. These are free, those guys are freaks of nature. The Nolan mm-hmm. Ryan's of the world, who are able to pitch into that almost fifty years old with that kind of velocity. Those yeah. are those are unicorns. Yeah. Well, most of the times, you're going to have these scenarios where you know you get excited about somebody, and then all of a sudden you're not so excited. Look at Fulmer. I mean, it wasn't Tommy mm-hmm. John, but it was another scenario. Yeah. Where you know he's rookie of the year one year, and then before you know it, he's scuffing to even come back. Yeah, and, and, and now it's like they're saying, yeah, you're a relief pitcher because we know you can't start anymore. You just don't have the stamina or the the, the bot. You can't handle it. But right. But have you ever heard the term uh, ten stap? T i n s t a a p p. There is that's the acronym for there's no such thing as a pitching prospect. Uh, essentially, that. Essentially, it's saying that it's referring to the fact that young pitchers have a high attrition rate and the fact that once you see that they're they're progressing, you don't leave them percolating the minors. You bring them up to the major leagues because you can't be sure how long they're going to last. And I think we're seeing it kind of happen with the Tigers. You know, with, uh, Alex Fajardo, for example, Alex Wentz, uh, Casey Mize has gotten, is injured now, uh, Franklin Perez. For example, yeah. who still I think he's pitched 19 innings total at, uh, ever since the Tigers traded for him. Uh, Spencer, you know, uh, Spencer Turnbull, uh, you know, it, that's why you, when people that, it's the risk you take. And I know the Tigers had to take this risk because that's kind of way the draft fell for them when they were tanking is that when you build your team around young pitching, it's a very risky endeavor because as we're seeing Young, uh, it's it's kind of a crapshoot when it comes to the health of these young pitchers, and there's absolutely no guarantee that they're going to be as you met, how Michael Fulmer. You know, who is to say that five years from now, Casey Mize is working out of the bullpen, much like Michael Fulmer is now. I mean, that's a great point, Michael Fulmer. He was a rookie of the year what four or five years ago. Now he's essentially a, a good setup man, but he's a setup man. I'm far, you know. In a far less valuable position, and a, you know, a needed one, but not as valuable as a starter. So, yeah, this is uh, again why why I, I was really wanted to kind of put the hold the horses on this team being the rebuild continuing to track up the way it has, just because starting pitching mm. is just such a risky endeavor to build when you build around young people. And right now, two of the three guys that this team is banking on to be the cornerstone of the rotation are hurt. We're, and they said, we're not saying they're hurt long term or this is going to be something that's a constant thing with them, but it is something you have to factor in. Well, yeah, I mean, the, I don't know what the, I don't know what the, what the solution is necessarily. I mean, uh, you can that's work on you just, you cannot uh, mechanics. Have you can maybe just simply, maybe simply, Al, go, go, you might just see a, a scenario where yeah. starting pitchers, and I know this is going to make a lot of people unhappy when I say this, that starting yeah. pitchers are just good, are just not going to be expected. We're going to maybe be in an era of baseball where starting pitchers are just not expected to go more than five innings. I think we're almost to that it point might right be, now, you know, to be honest Five innings you. might be 
the I new, think if a guy you know, goes seven, it's like it's orange is the new black, or... five is the new seven. Yeah. I mean, you know, we yeah. don't, I don't know that we'll see pitchers maybe down the line several years hence even expected to go longer than five innings. Right. Uh, I, they, Clayton Kershaw got pulled from a, from a pr- perfect game uh, a week or so ago. Um, after I think I don't want to say eighty pitches. I think it was, it was almost. I think it was after right seven around innings of perfect baseball. Why? Yeah. Well, even though he's playing Kershaw again, yeah. shortened spring training. Uh, Dave Robertson want to didn't want to push it. Uh, we're and talking he's, about and all he spent the, all of last year injured for the most part. Then this is a Hall of Fame. Field, you know, yeah. if you, if you can pull a guy like Kershaw, who's a Hall of Fame guy, I think he's a Hall of Fame guy. Yeah. Then. Anybody can be pulled, and I know that took. A, I know the Roberts took a lot of heat for that. I know the likes of Reggie Jackson and other old-time ball players, you know, uh, eviscerated, eviscerated him for that decision. Yeah. But, but well, I, well, let me add this to that, though. You know, people were worried about. You no, know, well, you should have let him go. Try to go for the nine in a perfect game. Well, Kershaw had his first start after that controversy yesterday. And I think he gave up like five or six runs in, in like five mm. innings or something like that. He was not the same pitcher. Uh, and so I, I, can exa- I can see exactly – I can see the Dodgers thinking because Kershaw is not the Kershaw of, of five years ago. He's not a workhorse anymore, and you have to treat him with kid gloves. And I think the best example I saw of that was, uh, you know, uh, Johan Santana, who was a great pitcher for the Twins, and he had one – Big season with the Mets, but he the there with Santana, he uh, the Mets had never had a no hitter ever in their franchise history. This is what maybe this eight years ago something like that. And Santana at that point was in his thirties, but still an effective pitcher. And he had a no hitter going late in the game, but the problem was his pitch count was getting higher yeah. and higher and right. higher, yeah. and. The, and uh, the Mets allowed him to finish that game. He got the no-hitter, but his pitch count was like almost 140. Wow. And he was never the same guy after that. He was okay the rest of that year, but he was not as good as he was early on. And his career was pretty much done after that season. Or uh, another example I throw out with this, with, with, well, you know, kind of, we're kind of digressing here, but we've kind of leaned into this, is Milt Wilcox is a guy I like to throw out there when it comes to pitching injured or pitching through injuries. In 1984, apparently Milt Wilcox, who was not a young pitcher at that point, he was, what, probably 35 or so around that period? Yeah. 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 And he essentially got through that season on painkillers for the most part. His arm was getting in such rough shape. But he made a determination that, he wanted to win a world, you know. He this was his chance. This was his chance to have a big year on a world uh, on a championship contending team, and it turned out he was right. He was a big part of their rotation. Had probably one of the best years of his career, and they won the World Series. But he also that was essentially the end of his career as an effective pitcher. He was never yeah, ever right. the same guy You're after right. that season. So, and yeah. on top of that, Al, mm-hmm. uh, Wilcox, if you look at the stats uh, yeah. from 84, had zero complete games. And that yeah. was by design. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sparky did not – all but said, look, you're, you will not have a perf- I mean, perfect game. You will not yeah. have a complete game this year. You will have – you will not. Uh, mm-hmm. And even when, when Mill was sailing along, maybe after six, seven innings, Sparky, well, he had, you know, he had Lopez. He had Berenger. He had, he had Hernandez. He had Doug Bear. He had an incredible bullpen. Why mm-hmm. not take advantage of him? that bullpen? Was lights out all year. Why? Mm-hmm. Why? Why risk it? And yeah. so Wilcox was was essentially told, "You will not throw a complete game this year," and he didn't. He had yeah. zero. I think like thirty four starts or whatever it was, and zero complete games. And that was by design. Yeah, I just, right. I just brought it up. Uh, the Look, there's no th- question the middle was mm-hmm. toward the end. And yeah. you're, you're right. He fell off a cliff. He went. Yeah, to Seattle. He, he had thirty three starts. No complete games, but still through 193 innings. But the thing is, yeah. after that season, he was 34 in 1984. After okay. that season, the two years combined after that, he had uh, 21 starts and about 90 innings pitched. And he, like I said, he was never the same guy after that. Right. You know, his career essentially ended in 1984. But, you know, in his case, he probably figured it was worth it, you know. So, uh, but, yeah, it's – it's it's a, I know if people get worked up over this when it comes to the to pitching, 
I, you know, I guess people have to remember that when you see someone like Justin Verlander, complete outlier. Most pitchers are not like him, you know, or or how come people aren't like Nolan Ryan? Because he, he was Nolan Ryan. He, those guys are like once in a generation type guys who are utter workhorses. I mean, Verlander's come back from Tom from Tommy John surgery like like nothing ever happened this year. I wish you know it's only been a couple starts. We'll see how the year goes. But those kind of guys are essentially outliers. You can't expect pitchers to be like them. So I can understand the Tigers being very careful, and you also have to think that with these guys, they're not they're not thinking this year. They're thinking two years, three years down the line when this team is, I think, truly built. At least that's I think the obviously the plan is, Greg. The tr- that's when they're really planning on making a move contention wise. Two years down the line, three years down the line, with these guys. That's when they will be in their prime when they're like 26, 29 years old. So it's. Anyway, all right. Now, we kind of got the derailed there if we're talking about Mel Wilcox and like that. Anyway, when it comes to the team itself, Greg, uh, they won their first series of the year against the Royals. Uh, the adult was rain short, and they took two or three. They are four and five right now. The, uh, offense is being carried by three guys. Austin Meadows has an OPS over 1,000. Spencer Torkelson, hitting with power, has an OPS of 907, leads the team in home runs and RBI. And obviously, before he was hurt, Javi Baez was hitting the ball all over the park. Uh, but as a team, Greg, the offense is struggling right now. It's near the bottom of Major League Baseball. With uh, their, they have an on-base percentage as a team of 290. they They're only slugging a little over 300. A team OPS of 608. Pitching is mid middle of the pack so far. Even with all the snuggles we just talked about, injury-wise, they were mid middle of the pack. Team ERA at 371, which isn't too bad. Uh, bad average against a 244. Uh, their team WHIP not bad at all at 1.19. And what's here's like the yin and yang. They don't strike people out, at least haven't striking people out, which is bad. They have uh, the K per nine is only 6.3. That is 29th in baseball. But on the plus side, Greg, they aren't walking anybody because the walks per nine are only 2.14. So uh, there's some good and bad there that they aren't putting people on base well, via the walk. But they aren't striking out people either, and the more opportunities teams get to have to put the ball in play, bad things can happen. I think that's the most – out of all these numbers I just looked at, I think that's the one that's most alarming for me is that this staff is not striking batters out. And in an era of three true outcomes, you know, the strikeout, walk, or home run, if you're not striking people out, bad things are going to happen. Well, I mean <laughs> – but the flip side to that, though, is yeah. the defense does seem to be – is improved. I think yeah. the defense is improved. Right. There was some great – I thought some great defensive plays made already. Mm-hmm. I think Falkelson has looked very comfortable at first base. He's made some yes. really nice scoops. Baez made that really highlight reel play on uh, mm-hmm. opening day. Right. Uh, just a big-time all-star play that not too many other short subs would make. Um, I think they're solid. Uh, they're not. I think they're better than they've been in the outfield. I mean, they're not. Grossman's still not great, but I think Meadows is, is good, and I think Badu is good, and, and if Derek Hill could ever be healthy, he's if, very good. Hill or Green come back, that improves the right. outfield defense immensely, because uh, then you're not playing Barnhart, guys out of position. Barnhart behind the plate, which I know yeah. that Kesher's defense doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily get a lot of, you know, we talk when we talk catcher's defense, we don't necessarily talk about balls put in play, of course. We talk about throwing runners out. We talk about how they frame pitches. We talk mm-hmm. about how they handle a pitching staff. We talk about how they call a game. That yeah. goes into the – I consider that part of a catcher's defense. Right. It's certainly not offense. I mean, what yeah. else are you going to call it? Right. But it's not – so, I mean, but catchers aren't flashing the leather, of course. But they are – they're still – you still need a, a – a, if you don't have a strong defensive catcher, at least a guy who can throw out base runners a, a at least 33% of the time, then that's going to hurt you because you're not mm-hmm. going to, you're going to get, you're going to start getting guys in a scoring position more often than, than you, they should be. And, and I know that the game isn't necessarily the game of the seventies and eighties where guys were stealing 70, 80 bases a year, but it, you know, it, they will pick on a guy who can't throw. I mean, right. baseball teams will, they will pick, they will send runners, Against weak armed catchers because why? Because they're good, mm-hmm. a good chance of being safe. And you don't have to be a, 
a speedster to, 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 to test a guy with a weak arm behind the plate. So that, those kinds of things, man, they don't, they're not sexy and they don't necessarily show up on the score sheet other than the percentages of th- runners you're throwing out, throwing out. That shows up. But a lot of that other stuff is very, you know, um, uh, falls in the intangible, uh, area. But, mm-hmm. but that's all you talk to any, any big league manager, any big league pitcher, and they will tell you how valuable it is to have a guy like Barnhart behind the plate. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Defense has not been bad. Now, like I said, it's not all-world caliber, and obviously it will get better, especially when you got Badu playing out of position. He's, he's, a, he's a better corner outfielder than he is a center fielder. Plus, he doesn't really have the arm for the position. And uh, obviously they're kind of patchwork at shortstop right now, but still they're hanging in there. Yeah, and that, you know, Having that pitching is being helped by their defense. It, it's, it's much better than it has been over the past couple of years. But I still wish they were striking out more pitchers. But that they're striking out more guys. But that might be also be playing into like when we saw Casey Mize's last start before he, uh, the these the uh, elbow injury came out. Is that 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 was the first that was the one thing people were noticing in that game. Is that I think he only had two swings and misses and the five innings he pitched and. Aces, uh, if you're going to be an ace, you got to miss more bats than that. So I get, that's still a big concern for me is that this team needs to strike out more guys. But, again, it's early. We're still talking small sample sizes, and uh, the jury's still out on a lot of this stuff. I mean, we could be talking about completely different issues two weeks from now. But speaking of completely different issues, Miguel Cabrera, Greg, he's getting close to 3,000 hits. Uh, Miggy is up to hit count uh 2,995. Actually, I should check as I'm talking to see if he's got a hit tonight. So, uh, what's that? He did get a hit tonight. Oh, so he's only four away now. Yeah, I see that. uh, Yeah, he he did get a hit tonight. So, it's 2,996. Four to go to 3,000. I do find it interesting that for the this is the they finally moved him down the order this year. He's down to fifth, even though if you ask me, he should be hitting more like sixth or seventh. And he's is hitting, but he's not hitting for any power at all. Uh, right. His uh, he's slashing 276, uh, 333. He's slugging only 345. That's a 678 OPS. And that's the thing with Mickey, though. This is pretty much who he is now. He's uh, he'll, you'll get the occasional extra base hit, but he's essentially a slap hitter at this point. A, a, a still a pretty you know he's still pretty good with the bat, but he's a singles hitter now. But what was bugging me, though, Greg, was the talk that over the weekend that there was a lot of silly talk. Oh, should the Tigers bench him to make sure he gets number 3,000 at home? We don't want him to see it happen in Kansas City. And at least that all became moot. He had, like, one hit Saturday, and then there was a Sunday rain out, and now there's, like, a six-game homestand. Odds are Cabrera will likely get to number 3,000 sometime this week at home. But... I'm just curious. If this once he gets the 3,000, he's got the 500, and I think he's almost got 600 doubles as well. It's like he's going to yeah. be one of three guys to have the uh, uh, 3,000, 600, 500. With the 300 batting, is, right? Yeah. And I wonder if this is if now they they're going to say okay, now we can start figuring, especially once people start getting healthy. That's probably playing into this as well because I have a feeling they will start sitting Cabrera a lot more. Once Riley Green comes around, you know, and some of these and some of these other guys start getting healthy, and that because I don't want to see Miguel Cabrera play 140 games. His bat just isn't good enough for 140 games at the DH. Play him 110 games or something like that. Once he hits those numbers, because I mean, I, it's been a pleasure watching Cabrera all these years, and it's great he's going to reach these numbers as a Tiger. But if this team wants to truly compete. You know, having Miguel Cabrera in the middle of your order as a singles hitter is not the most optimal thing you want. Well, you know, it, it's. But is he getting on base? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, if he's three uh, three thirty three, it, so yeah, it's, and yeah, he's got an average good. on base percentage, but that OPS is awful. You know, six seventy eight oh, yeah. out of your DH. You need a lot. Yeah. You need two hundred no. more points out of your DH than that. No, you're right. No, that's completely correct. Uh, yeah. the, the, you. You get caught between a rock and a hard place if you're yeah. if you're a guy like AJ a. Hinch or if you're the Tigers organization in general. When you've got a guy like this who's you know going to the Hall of Fame immediately as soon as he's a, right. uh, eligible, when he's on the downside of his career, 
you you're in this weird scenario now. It's like you know they've already like, Hinch has already dropped him to I think fifth in the fifth he's in the fifth order. In the order. He's hit fifth all okay. year. Okay, right. Um, that's the, that's the first concession, if you will, yeah. to the fact yeah. that well, yeah. he's not you know he's not quite the Miggy, and he and he, and he shouldn't be. We, you should expect him to be at age thirty nine the same Miggy was at twenty nine. Okay, no. So that's the first shoe that's fallen. Mm. Now is this dropping down in the order by one point or one space? He mm. may he may drop him down even further. You know, he may you may see games where he bats sixth. I don't know that he'd ever yeah. drop from yeah. seven, but he might he may. But, you know, well, sooner or later, mean, they're going to have to move Torkelson up in the order. He, well, yeah, he, and, if and, he keeps right. hitting, they're not going to keep him seventh. Right. Uh, yeah. But this was another smart move by Hinch to, to, to not put in any undue pressure on this kid. You mm-hmm. know, he doesn't have to he doesn't have to bat fourth or fifth in this lineup anyway, frankly. Right. Uh, talking about Torkelson. Right. But no, this is but this is what happens when you get a guy like Mickey, who is at this in the autumn of his career, if you will. And and you, it's like okay, how do we use this guy? You know, you don't you want to give him the the the, the respect that he deserves from having played mm-hmm. all those years, but you also are trying to win baseball games at the same time, and you're also right. trying to do what's best for the team, and that's where it gets a little sticky. And now he, now that soon he will have, soon he will have uh, uh, achieved these milestones. You mentioned the the 600 doubles, obviously on the verge of 3,000 hits. He's, he got the 500 home runs last year. So all mm-hmm. that's out of the way now. So now it's going to be no longer about can he reach these milestones. It's going to be more about how do we manage his playing time in a scenario where we expect to be in the mix uh, yeah. of maybe a playoff, or at least within shouting distance of a playoff spot, come July, August. So how do we manage his playing time? Now, you know, I, I respect that he's hitting over 300, this, you know, after the first 10 games of the season. Or not hitting to. over 300, but well, he's not getting on base over 300. He's close. He's close. 278. But like you said, so. like you said he's, a, he's a singles hitter, essentially, at least right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he is what he is. So you just yeah. can't, what you have to, if you're Hinch now, you just have to understand, okay, what is this guy now? And E.J. Hinch knows this. He doesn't. He oh, yeah. He's no he, dummy. Yeah. He's right. He's under no delusions of grandeur that he's managing the the Miggy who won the Triple Crown and the MVP awards. He knows mm-hmm. that. that, that he's yeah. not dumb. So now, but now that's so he knows that. But what he doesn't necessarily know is what is he? I mean, what is he now? Mm-hmm. How does he help the team? Where do I bat him? How often do I play him? You mentioned Green. Uh, they went out and got Meadows uh, when mm-hmm. Green went down. Uh, and Meadows is still going to be on the roster when Green comes back. So it wasn't yeah. a tip of that thing. So now you've got to find, you know, like you mentioned, you got to find some, you know, I think you mentioned a couple of weeks ago about having four outfielders or whatever, something, five really in a way. Yeah, right. Well, so somebody's going to have to either sit or or beat the DH and Miggy sits down. Yeah. It, that's it's all going to be how, and that's where, the and that's where, Al, the, it, that's why it's so important when you have a guy like Hinch who seems to really get it when it comes to player relationships. He mm-hmm. seems to really understand the value of having good relationships with his players. You have a manager that doesn't have that, and you present that manager with this Miggy situation, can really go sideways. It yeah. can really go sideways. But you've got a guy like Kinch who understands it all. He gets the whole, he gets the historical nature of this whole thing. He gets what the, what Miggy means to the franchise, but he also gets that, that, that he has to have a relationship with him and, and he has to get the buy-in. He said, he said I got immediate buy-in when I told Miggy that he was going to hit fifth. Okay, mm-hmm. that's great. Uh, now, will he, but will he get the buy-in when he sits some 40, 50 games a year? This year, because uh, it, it essentially kind of like the NBA version of uh, coach's decision did not play, you know, yeah. when he's healthy, but he's just not playing because yeah. he wants to, for, for whatever reason, whether he wants to manage his body, whether he wants to he doesn't feel like that he, he gives the, the team as good of a chance to win on any, on any given day. But I tell you, uh, I still I still feel confident with this guy at the plate when there's men in scoring mm-hmm. position. Yeah, He's still a very good I don't care if he hits a single or or, or, or doesn't hit a home run. Uh, he's still mm-hmm. uh, like me. To me, he's still a, a dangerous hitter when there's men on base, even if he's just getting a single to keep a rally going. I mean, he's. I, I still feel comfortable with him up with the game on the line, and not because I think he's going to hit a home run, but yeah. because I think he's going to get a base hit. Yeah, yeah. It's a. Uh... 
I'm just glad you're right. I think more than anything that uh, helps this team, or I think it's having AJ Hints here. That more than anything that uh, that may help uh, smooth things over when changes are going to have to be made. And when Green comes back, Green's going to play, Meadows is going to play, Badu is going to play, Grossman's going to play, Torkelson's going to play. You know, so yeah, the most likely guy to start taking days off is going to be Miguel Cabrera. Especially if these if these other guys hit the way we're anticipating they, they should be able to hit. And some of these guys just need to play, period. The young guys specifically, they need to play. Right. So it's uh yeah, it's 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 interesting to see how this is all gonna play out. But yeah, the most it's a I'm think good I'm just glad it's likely gonna happen on this trip where the three thousand hits will be knocked out, that everybody can kinda of move on and settle into the grind of the season and start figuring out the future of this team, because the future of this team does not involve Miguel Cabrera. Only one more year of Miggy after this, because you know he's not retiring if that kind of money on the table. Well, no, and, and he's not going to retire. The Tigers will ultimately buy him out, because there's a lot of money left on that contract on a buyout. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I was just looking at the tonight's stats, and uh, Tyler Alexander only went one inning tonight. Right. The Tigers starting right. pitcher. <laughs> Oh, and I, I saw he had like a 42 pitch inning. Like, holy crap! Oh my, this is this is this is going to get ugly. The uh, way things are looking until uh, four things improve, it might get a little uglier with the Tigers pitching. All right, uh, let's touch on some wings and pistons before we start wrapping things up. Uh, Greg, the Red Wings were officially eliminated from playoff cup contention. Why? Since we last spoke, uh, they were actually eliminated on April 9th. Uh, they will miss the postseason for the sixth straight year. Uh, and uh, obviously the other thing to bring up, as it currently stands, the Wings would pick eighth in the NHL draft. And that is that was a, what kind of surprised me, is that as bad as this team is playing right now, they really aren't in a very good tanking position because they actually played fairly well for about half a season you know, I think we mentioned this on the last show. About mid-February, they were still within six points of the wild card spot, and then over the last six weeks, this season has literally spiraled into the ground, into what to, to the tank, as they might say, to the point where now they said after a really bad weekend of hockey, Wings lost uh, four nothing to the Rangers Saturday and six to one Sunday to the Panthers. The Wings announced that Dylan Larkin is going to miss the remainder of the year after having what they are calling core muscle surgery. So the tank, what's, yeah. what little they can tank is going to happen now because their best player is going to miss the final six games of the year. But it's really funny how this team went from, wow, things might be improving finally. Things are looking up to, holy shit, this is a really, really bad team. <laughs> and by the way, this core muscle surgery, if I'm not mistaken, and I know there, there's probably different versions of it, but wasn't that the same kind of surgery, Al, that 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 really put Magley or Donez behind the eight ball a couple times when he was with the I Tigers? I believe you are right, because I was, I was um, thinking of Timmer Verlander had to deal with an injury like that. It was Ver, Verlander as well. Verlander yeah. as well. And yeah, kind of ruined been, one season of Verlander. He was not the same yeah, pitcher that season. Right, right, right. And um, so that's nothing to be trifled with, by the way. And I right. hope that yeah, he, they're saying I, he should be okay for uh, – by September, he'll be ready for training camp in September. But it's you're right. It's definitely something worth watching. When your best, your best player, your captain, is having major surgery, you know, a, a core muscle injuries. That, that is definitely something worth watching. But yeah, this uh, no, no. After 25 years of playoffs, Greg, but now we've, they've missed the playoffs for six straight. Wouldn't be surprised if that streak lasts at least a couple more. The one bright spot of this entire mess of a season mm -hmm. uh has been larkin yeah. and, I, and, and and you know me i've been I, I was shouting it i felt like sometimes i was shouting into the wind mm -hmm. last year you know who is this guy you kind of play into the wind? Really? no <laughs> <laughs> shaking my fist at the sky yeah um you know we had kenny cal on in september i said kenny what is this kid what kind of player and he didn't even know he said well you know he hemmed and hawed and said you know maybe he's not as good as we think and he came out and and you got to give the guy props he was almost a point of, uh, he was back to the dylan larkin of a few years ago yeah where he was almost a point of point of game I th player. yeah i think before and this year his best year was probably his rookie season 69 points in 71 games mm -hmm. um so, uh, 31 goals 30 uh, uh, hey 
hats off. Yeah. I mean, he proved he he quelled my concern about what kind of a player he is and what you know where where we're going to kind of you're going to have well he answered the bell he had a great year yeah uh, playing on a crappy team um and uh, essentially having to carry the load because they, they're very they're so thin and up front in terms of goal scorers and so forth and uh he had a great year mm-hmm. and, and he had a year worthy of a captain and he 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 handled himself like a captain i think all year long with terms yeah. of talking to the media um you know being the spokesperson for the team um i thought he had all that very well. I know that uh, he's he's started to crack in, in recent days, mm-hmm. uh, saying things like the you know, guys don't have any pride, and it's brutal, and I hate this, and I, I I don't like going home for the summer to play in the world. I don't play this game to go home in the summer and play in the worlds. I mm-hmm. go I play this game to play in the playoffs in, in the spring. Right. And he has he said he's only made the playoffs once. That was his rookie year. And the last, you know, you mentioned the last six years, no playoffs, and, and you're absolutely right. Probably going to be another one or two years at least before they get back. So, but he's to me, he's fine. To me now, I have zero concerns mm-hmm. about Dylan Larkin as a captain or as a hockey player going forward. So that's great. The bad news is uh, there's been so much, been so much re- regression, especially defensively. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the goaltending and uh, the kid from Ca- uh, Cal- uh, Carolina, Ned, uh, who I don't, who uh, to me has been a disappointment. He hasn't played as well as I thought he was going to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, the defense has been lousy, as you know, uh, except for Cider. Um, there's not a lot of building blocks up front. Uh, although there's a lot of young kids coming through. I know they got this kid Sunquist they got in the trade, Oscar Sun, because mm-hmm. they like they think he's kind of like a Holmstrom kind of a player or a or a um, uh, Who's the guy who had to retire because of the concussions, the head stuff? Uh, Franzen. Yeah. They, they, they say he's a lot like those guy, guys. Right. Who's big in front of the net and causes havoc. But, you know, it's the the the, the, the rebuild started three years ago when, when Eisenman was hired. It, mm-hmm. I know fans like to go back to 17 and 18, but really, he really, he, you can't, can't count that. You can only count after he was hired. And I don't, I don't know what, what you think. I, 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 Part of me thinks they're more toward the end of the rebuild than the beginning, but they've regressed so much, Al, since the All-Star break, that it just gives me pause. It makes me rethink if they are as far along as I think they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, like I said, I, there, there are signs that, there's, that they're going to turn this thing around, but these last six, eight weeks, Greg, have been just so discouraging. You know, yeah. I, you know I was... I was hopeful for a while that, you know, this could be turning things around. But, yeah, there, there's still a lot of – what hasn't helped either is that uh, Ken Holland's top draft picks before you – know, his last few draft picks before he – top draft picks before he moved on to uh, Western Canada have not really panned out at all. Uh, I mean, the the best of, of all those – God, I don't know how many early first-round – first-round picks he had was, Dennis, was uh, Michael Rasmussen. And he's essentially a third round grinding center power play guy. You know, Cholowski, I don't even know if he's in the NHL at this point, for example. So that, that hasn't way. helped the rebuild either. <laughs> yeah. That, this has, that hasn't helped the rebuild either. Is that a lot of Ken Holland's decisions at, at the start of, of, right at the start of this rebuild didn't pan out. And now Steve Eiserman is cleaning up that mess. And a lot of that was just, as we've talked about in this podcast, cleaning out the old contracts, moving on from prospects that aren't in future plans. And uh, essentially, I, I, if you add, in a lot of ways, Greg, you can say the true rebuild started the moment Steve Eiserman was hired. Because right. Ken Holland, some of the decisions, he, uh, he still had one foot in the, Compete for the playoffs with the and one foot in the well. Maybe we should start thinking about rebuilding, and he never really was able to. He just tr- kept straddling that line, much like the Pistons did for a decade, and that leaves you in no man's land. And the, and the Wings were in no man's land before they hired Steve Eiserman. So it's a. Uh, I'm hoping well, for the best, but I'm still not. I'm still in looking right. towards a couple well, bad years. I think. Yeah. 
the yeah, fans are a little nervous right now. They're 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 getting a little antsy. Yeah. There's a little bit of anti and stuff I see on social media, and that's that's to be expected. But yeah. the one thing though that is good yeah. about this, the way he's the way he's going about it, and he obviously he's being very deliberate. Yeah. He's got all the he's got all the cred in the world, so he doesn't have to do this fast. Right. One. Well, the one thing that I like about the way he's doing it though, he's he's doing it um, with financial wisdom if you will he's mm-hmm. not giving out big contracts he's not he's not he when he does sign free agents that are veterans he's mm-hmm. not breaking the bank he's not overpaying because he knows it's these guys that he's signing aren't necessarily the cream of the crop anyway but he's not doling out big fat contracts he's not trying to go for the quick fix you know he's being very deliberate uh, very um um smart with with the money uh not putting the the, the, the team in a situation that they're going to regret down the line because yeah. of uh, you know he's creating a, a, an environment where they, they you know, if they, if they ever get to a point where they can loosen the per, purse strings and they want to go mm-hmm. after some people um they'll be able to do it because they'll have they won't they will at that point they won't be saddled with ugly 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 contracts right the and there is and there is still a, there's still a lot of really good young People coming up. The problem is they're still a couple of years away from really, you know, contributing at the NHL level. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, he hit big with with Raymond and with Cider, no question about it. Those are right. two huge building blocks, absolutely. And um, but I, I'm starting to wonder if if the goaltending situation is 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 indeed fixed now. I mean, yeah. I, you know, they, somebody said, "Well, we'll see where what you know we're seeing now what Ned." is doing with a bad defense. Well, yeah. that's true. That's there. I mean, you know, he had a much better defense playing in front of him in Carolina. Um, and maybe that's something else you got to keep you keep your eyes on when you're, when you're doing metrics for goalies is how good is the defense in front of them. Yeah. And it's true. I mean, he does not play with nearly the kind of defense he had in Carolina. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing it uh, with his inconsistent play. There's, they, they went out and they, they signed that big guy, uh, a free agent uh, from overseas uh, last week. I can't remember his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, to provide some depth, to, to some goalie depth. They've got mm-hmm. a couple of kids uh, that are, High kind of high prospects, but they're again they're not near ready to play in the NHL. So you know I don't know what you, there's a, there's so many holes still. I think what what gets people a little bit nervous and a little bit anxious mm-hmm. is there seems to still be the same kind of holes Al yeah. on the roster now as there were when he was hired. And I think but you're right. I think what he's done is it's he hasn't necessarily improved. The team all that much, but part of doing what he has to do is to weed out the guys that he, he just aren't going to be here. Yeah. The guys that you, know, you mentioned, Slavsky. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been he's been waived by the Red Wings. He's been waived by the, the by Vegas. He's been waived by uh, there was another team that waived him. He's been waived like three times. He's almost been waived out of the league. Yeah, and that was a number one draft choice. Right. Yeah, exactly. The top you know, top ten or something. Yeah, and he just you know it just hasn't panned out. And so you know. He, People just think that the think they think the rebuild is just getting players, mm-hmm. okay, bringing guys in, drafting, um, you know, making small little trades. Uh, it, it's not the rebuild. Part of the a large part of the rebuild is weeding out, getting rid of guys that aren't going to that just aren't going to be part of it. Yeah, and finding out who those players are, and and who they're not, and and and. and Making moves on them accordingly. That's that's as, as much of the rebuild as acquiring players is weeding out players, yeah. and that's and that's what he's been doing. The the problem is that some of the guys that some of this weeding out process just seems to be seems to be a little bit laborious and 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 uh, and uh, tedious. And but it, it has to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's. Uh... Oh yeah, it's you know it, yeah, and I'm 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 still a believer in this. They call it the Iser plan. It's but the Iser plan is going to be slow and tedious, as you said, and uh, there's going to be some growing pains, obviously. And it's uh, more than anything, it's uh, you 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 need to take make the point home that he's setting this team up not to have bad contracts, and after a decade plus of bad contracts. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, and actually, Eisman has pretty much either been able to write out those contracts, and he's bought out a couple of them. 
but uh, for the most part, this team is looking much better set up financially because uh, they are going to have some decisions to make money-wise, specifically with uh, Tyler Bertuzzi and with Dylan Larkin. You know, how long do they want to lock those guys up for? You know, and are they still going to be players in their prime when you anticipate the Wings being a perennial playoff team again? I mean, that's the decision Eisenman's going to have to make. And he, like, we saw that, that he decided that Anthony Mantha and Andreas Athanasiu were not those players, and he moved on from them. And for the most part, they, that was the right decision, I think, for him, and for the Wings, and for those players. Uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Larkin is here for the long term. I'm still not sold that he thinks that of Tyler Bertuzzi. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Bertuzzi's a solid player. Bit of a knucklehead. But I wouldn't say a bit of a knucklehead. He is a knucklehead. But he's also a good player. I just don't know how much money you want to invest in a guy like Tyler Bertuzzi. That's, you know, he's the kind of player I'm afraid you end up overpaying for the production he's going to end up giving you. You know, uh, it's considering that I don't know how productive he would be if he's playing with someone other than Dylan Larkin, if you know what I'm saying. You know, if he's yeah. not with an elite center, is he still going to score goals? That I don't know. All right. Uh, why don't we touch a little Pistons before we wrap up? Because I think Greg's got a cold cocktail waiting for him here. So, <laughs> uh, Plus, we had a lot of headaches to get this damn podcast started. So we're a little giddy tonight, to say the very least. We've got to touch on the Pistons. Um, Pistons have ended their season, Greg, with the third worst overall record, just like last year. Uh, they have a essentially the same odds as they did last year getting the number one pick, about 40% chance mm. of landing in the top three. Worst they can pick will be, I think, seventh overall. I think the highest odds they have is ending up at the number five position. But that, who knows what's going to happen with the lottery. It's, but looks like there's about five players, three for sure, who are who they think are going to be game-changing type players. We'll have to wait and see how that all falls out. But I think the bigger con- uh the bigger controversy, but there's that Detroit versus everybody thing again, is Cade Cunningham was named a finalist for NBA Rookie of the Year. And he had, for even though he had a very slow start, mostly due to the injury and the fact that the Pistons aren't a good team, Cunningham put up numbers not often seen by a rookie. He put up, he led, I think he led rookies in scoring, he led rookies in assists, he had the solid rebounding numbers. A problem is, is that, his uh, being that essentially the entire team rests on on Cade's shoulders, his efficiency numbers are pretty low. He had, he's he has, nice. he's got a lot of turnovers things like that because he's the, he nice. is the main ball handler for the Pistons. But his two, his main competition for the uh, Rookie of the Year, Evan Mobley of the uh, Cavs, and uh, Scotty Barnes of the Raptors. Raptors, uh, I believe uh, the Raptors are a playoff team. And uh, the Cavaliers made it to the play-in. I believe they got knocked out in the play-in games. Uh, but they they are essentially fourth and fifth options on their teams. Had very good seasons, without a doubt. I mean, if if it was just one of these guys, I think we meant we talked about this last, on the last podcast. Any one of like five guys would be the rookie of the year in a normal season. But it's uh, it's funny that people are saying. You know, these guys were, were not the main options on their team, but they are on playoff teams, and they're counting that against Cunningham. And people are saying, well, that doesn't make a difference in the past. How come it does now? And it's playing into that damn Detroit versus everybody thing. But what's really funny about it, all this whole controversy is, uh, I think most of the pundits are saying, well, Cunningham isn't the rookie of the year. Well, we don't, you know, because of reasons. But they're also saying he will like he's going to end up being the best overall basketball player in the draft. It may be a year or two, but he's going to be better than all of them. So uh, uh, this just brings out all that fan BS of Detroit versus everybody, and they're taking this him not going to he's going he's not going to win Rookie of the Year. I think there's no doubt about that. Even though he put, he had an electric last couple months of the season, but fans getting all wrapped up in this Rookie of the Year crap. You know, if you go back and look who was one rookie of the year in the NBA, there was a lot of guys that had nothing careers. Not, had Their careers yeah. were nothing. And right. so, you know, taking it as a sign of disrespect, no. I just think it's a combination of there's a lot of good rookies. 
rookies that are playing for playoff contending teams get more attention. And oftentimes, with anything, first impressions tend to stick with people. And Cade Cunningham's first impression was not good because he had a bad first month of the season because he didn't have an off. He was injured most of the off uh, through training camp, and then he essentially his training camp was the first month of the season. So that first impression stuck with people for quite a while until he turned up the wick over the last couple months of the season. But don't take him not winning as an insult. It's just how things fell this year. I just find it all ridiculous. No, I agree with you. I, I, I told you, I think last time we were together, I said I could care less if Cunningham wins the yeah. Rookie of the Year award. It, it means nothing. It, yeah, it's a nice thing for him to put on his mantle and, and a, add to his trophy case uh, right. as his career goes on, but it doesn't mean anything. I, you know, if, if, the, the great Isaiah Thomas, uh, for whatever reason, did not win Rookie of the Year award in 1982, yes. uh, despite essentially turning the Pistons mm-hmm. around from a 21-win team to a 39-win team. He lost. Who won it that year? Buck Williams. You say, well, why Buck Williams? Well, Buck Williams played on a team yep. that um, made the playoffs, mm-hmm. although they were out in the first round, but they they won 44 games and made the playoffs. Right. Uh, so Buck, but if you look at Buck Williams' numbers versus Isaiah's that year, yeah. You know, you, you, you say, well, gee, I, I don't see it. I don't see Buck being the rookie of the year. I think, well, why right. isn't it Isaiah? Mm-hmm. You know, he handles the ball all the time. He's the point guard. Uh, Buck Williams was a, was a power forward, but yeah. it, that's just the way it worked out because the Nets were a better team and 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 so forth. And um, so I mean, and who can, and who had the better NBA career? Well, as good yeah. as Buck Williams was, obviously Isaiah did. Mm-hmm. So it, it means nothing. The, yeah, you're right. The rookie, it's it's nice to yes, it's nice to have a player who is indeed the rookie of the year, of course. But you know, it, it's you know the thing about about Cunningham though. I was looking up the, the numbers between he and, and Mobley, for example. Yeah, and Mobley is only a 66% free throw shooter. Cade's like 84% or something, and mm-hmm. Mobley got to the line like a hundred more times than Cunningham did. Now Cunningham yeah. is not getting yet the right. whistles. Mm-hmm. Either way, he's not getting he's not getting to the line, and he's and he's getting called for a lot of fouls. Yeah, and he's, he was in a lot of early foul trouble. Uh, for Wayne Casey, where he would get his second foul when the first quarter was still going, so that but that's I, that will also I think rectify itself. I think the longer he's in the league, uh, you know that'll start to. I'm not really concerned about that being a a, mm-hmm. a recurring thing, but it is it is something to consider when you when you look at the two players. Mobley got to the free throw line way more than but than Cade, but he only shot 66 percent from the line, and, and Cade shot right. 84. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, free throws are a big part of the game. And, and you know, I, I those 66 percent free throw shooters just you know, just drive me crazy. Mm-hmm. When, they, when they go to, when they go up to the line, you, you don't trust them. Yeah. There's no trust there that they're going to be able to knock down a, a key free throw or two. Whereas a guy like Cunningham, if he's shooting 84 percent, that tells me that I'm pretty confident he's going to. And he did yeah. down the stretch. And he hit some big free throws when he did get to the line. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, those are all those little things. Um but the, the, he, he's he's a great player. He's going to be a great one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they get another lottery pick with him this year. I don't think they'll get lucky enough to get the number one pick. But I don't right. I don't think it matters. I think I think they're I think they're guaranteed of getting a really really good player. Yeah. And uh, you add that really really good player to what they already have, and don't go to sleep on Killian Hayes because I think he's improving. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know all of a sudden maybe Jeremy Grant is trade bait. Yeah. Well, maybe they don't need him anymore. You know, maybe they will trade him in mm-hmm. the off season or, right. or whatever. Uh, and they and the, and the the Blake Griffin money comes off the books, so that that gives them some more financial flexibility. Uh, and I can see why the Pistons fans are excited. I mean, they really are for a team that won twenty three games. They're very excited. Look at some of the other fan bases of teams that won twenty three games or, or thereabouts. They're not nearly as excited about you know. You look at the Kings. Mm-hmm. You go you, you scroll the Sacramento Kings Twitter. It's doom and gloom over there. I mean, they're yeah. just beside themselves. They're, they're, they've been wandering around in the desert <laughs> yeah, they have. for 15 years. Yeah. And they don't see any hope. They see no hope. Yeah. And the, the Pistons fan base is really energized about this team. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny you bring up the Kings because uh, they were more than happy to get rid of Marvin Bagley the third. You know, yeah. And, yeah. And all of a sudden here in Detroit, they're like, this guy has a future here. And he, he paired up beautifully as a pick-and-roll guy with Cade Cunningham. 
you know, when in Sacramento, all they did for him was stick him out, stick him in a corner, have him shoot the occasional three. You know, it's all about the organization and how players are used. So yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, the Kings are. You know, the, the Pistons things are looking up. The Kings are going to be the Kings. You're right about that. That's a, that's a great point about, or as they call them, the Kangs, K-A-N-G-Z, the Kangs. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that, that's a franchise that's lost in the desert, to say the very least. Yeah, but, all right. I think that's about it, Greg. We've covered everything pretty much we wanted to cover. It's been quite a, it's been quite the roller coaster tonight to say the very least. But we've made it almost to the end of the podcast, which means it's time for your jerk of the week. Well, I'm I, I have to go with two people co jerks of the week. Uh oh, uh oh. It was yeah. It was in the wake of the tragic death of Dwayne Haskins, who of course uh, was hit by a car, as right. you know. Oh, I can see ago. where you're going with this one. Yeah, and uh, our old friend Gil Brandt, who mm-hmm. should be put out to pasture by now, <laughs> yeah. was on a, I think he was on a radio program or something, and went into this odd, bizarre, uh, I don't know what you call it a rant, but this, mm-hmm. this little uh, diatribe about Haskins being a, you know, kind of a, a knucklehead and yeah. and uh, victim blaming him and. And same thing. So it was always something with him, and he lived to die, and you know, all these really weird things that you would never say about somebody in the hours after they were uh, died in such a fashion. And the other yeah. person is Adam Schefter, and Adam Schefter put out a, a bad tweet. He said that uh, you know, he, in his rush to be first with the news, yeah. he said Wayne Haskins, who struggled to hang on in the NFL, essentially, is what he said. Yeah. You know, his hit was killed and blah, blah, blah. And, then, of course, he took a lot of flack. He deleted the tweet. Of course, was everybody screen grabbed it before he deleted it. He put out another tweet, which was essentially the same tweet without that language in it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, which was such a, it was so obvious what he was trying to do. He was trying yeah. to, you know, scrub it. He can't have a scrub a tweet, of course. And finally issued an apology uh, i think the next day or two later uh brand himself did as well by the way uh he did tweet out uh or one of his people tweeted out an apology uh they had a poor choice of words it was inappropriate i you know i i, I know the pain that the task this family is going through I, I apologize okay so I, I give them props for indeed apologizing but what's going through the mind of somebody who's you know, somebody's died tragically, and you, all you can talk about is how they struggled and how they lived to die. And, you know, I, I mean, I, it wasn't like this kid overdosed on drugs, okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't like a one bias scenario where, you know, he just, you know, uh, got into some bad uh, – got into a bad scene and, and kind of did himself in. Haskins was – you know, you know, you can make – you can talk about the wisdom of trying to cross an interstate. I, I, will, give, I will give you that. Yeah. But it by no stretch of the imagination means that he deserved to die or was looking to die or was living life on the edge. And, and Schefter, why he found it necessary to point out that Haskins was struggling to catch on the NFL, I don't know what that has anything to do with anything. And so and those guys, you know, should know better, both of them. So yeah. my, my trip this week going to Al, Adam Schefter and to Gil Brandt. Yeah, good call that uh... – why Schefter decided to mention? Why even talk about his NF, the, his, un, his his underwhelming NFL career and a tweet about his death was just mind boggling. But uh, I'm not surprised coming from guys like Schefter and Gil Brandt. Like I, said, I think you nailed it. He's just he needs to go out the pasture. All right, my jerk of the week. Uh, well, uh, we'll start with this. If there's one city where opening day is an even bigger deal than the, than they make it in Detroit, it's Cincinnati, where for decades that was actually <laughs> the true season opener. The first pitch was always in Cincinnati. Since it's a huge deal there, though they have a parade the whole nine yards when it comes to opening day. It's a big deal in Cincinnati. Unfortunately, Cincinnati has shitty ownership, <laughs> to say the least. And they they almost made the playoffs last year. They had a pretty competitive team. And yet they decided to start dismantling the team. Like they decided we're not going to pay. Uh, oh God damn! How can I can't remember his name all of a sudden. Uh, Nick Castellanos, who was up, uh, who hit the cover off the ball for them the last couple of years. They let him walk in free agency, for example. They didn't want to pay him. So 
essentially decide we're just going to dismantle this team that was on the verge of the playoffs for a couple years. And instead of taking the next step in an expanded era of playoffs, we're going to start rebuilding, which pissed off the fans to no end. Because this is a franchise, I think, that has two playoff wins in, since 1995 or something like that. Well, uh, during uh, uh, during pregame, uh, the pregame of the uh, ra- the radio broadcast pregame on opening day, uh, Phil, what's his name? I'm bringing it up here. Uh, it's oh god damn, I had it right here. Oh yeah, team president Phil Castellini. I believe he's like a, a son of the owner. Uh, he was being interviewed, and did you see these things turn into you know you know these kind of interviews, Greg? They're kind of they throw softballs and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, in this interview, Castellini decided to put his foot in his mouth, big time, because uh, he was asked why fans should stay loyal to a franchise that slashed their payroll, had won a playoff series since 1995, and is starting to tank again. And this was what he had to say. Well, where are you going to go? Sell the team to who? That's the other thing. You want to have this debate? What would you do with this team to have it be more profitable, make more money, compete more in the current economic system than this game exists? That, that this game exists. Would, you, would it be to pick it up and move it somewhere else? Be careful what you ask for. So essentially, Greg, he threatened to move the team. If people didn't support a team that really has doesn't spend money on payroll, is tanking again, and is a pissed off, and has had shitty ownership going back to Marge, that racist Marge shot. So, and then he essentially doubled down on all this when when he tried, tried when he was asked to try and get out of it. You know, he didn't walk it back at all. It's, it's funny that he didn't even go on to. We're gonna tr- we're gonna try and make this team more competitive. He just played. It's all about the money. It's about the profit. We're not making enough, and essentially telling the fans that you know if you don't want to root for this team, get screwed. It's amazing. And then he gave a very weak apology at the next day, and this was his apology. It was a big nothing burger. I apologize to Reds fans and regret the comments that I made earlier. We love this city, we love this team, and we love our fans. I understand our fans are angry, and I am sorry. Oh, my God, Greg. That, that is hilarious that the team president of the Reds, a team that doesn't spend money on payroll, has gotten rid of all their big money players and is going to tank again despite being in contention for the past couple years, insulted their fans and it said it's all about budgeting and we're in a small market and blah, blah, blah. That is the last thing people want to hear, especially on opening day. After <laughs> you lock the players out for three months. Oh, my right. God, Greg. How clueless can uh, baseball ownership be? They continually say stupid things like this. So my jerk of the week is Phil Castellini and essentially Major League Baseball ownership for being – so goddamn clueless. It, no, if you it's the old, it's better to, uh, you know, just don't say anything if you can't say anything correct. It's absolutely ridiculous, Greg. I could not believe on opening day in Cincinnati, Cincinnati's team president insulted the fan base for wanting a winning team. <laughs> Oh my it's, God. it's stuff like it's stuff like that, Al. That this ma- that this makes you shake your head at the, at the thought of why any fan would be on the side of the owners and these sort of exactly, labors. exactly. Uh, I, I, you know, or I mean, I know. Okay, a lot of times if they're on the owner side, it, it's simply because they're not on the player side. But I, right. why you, then take no sides? Yeah. If, because I, I don't know why you'd be on, on the on the owner side. I want to thank uh, Mike Shani, of course, for. Um, a, uh, when you listen to this interview, by the way, I, I, you, you may, you, if you, it might be a little was, choppy. <laughs> if you sense that there were some edits made to it, it's because Al did indeed have to make some edits. We had some some call issues with with Mike, but he we soldiered on. We got it. We got it in, and, and we appreciate that. And yeah, we are going to have him back after the draft. We'll talk a little bit more right. about how the lines did. Correct, and we will uh, talk. Uh, we'll do that and uh, follow him on Twitter at Shoddy, and follow him on follow up the thirty third team at the thirty third team. FB on uh, Twitter as well. Good stuff there. A lot of good people on the 33rd team. Uh, we're 
might uh, we got a couple things cooking as far as guests in the future. Uh, former Tiger Ike Blessett may be with us uh, in the next few couple of shows. Mm. Uh, Ike's been in the news a little bit lately for some of the uh, financial problems he's had by virtue of the fact that he wasn't in the big leagues quite long enough to draw a pension, and he's had some health issues and so forth, but he still loves baseball, still loves the city of Detroit, and, he, and, and he's quite a story. We're going to try to get Ike on uh, sooner rather than later. And also our old friend uh, Greg Seamus, the uh, sports photographer extraordinaire, whose images you may not know it, but you've seen all over the Internet and all over everywhere. He's, the, he's one of the best photographers going right now. He just covered the Masters. And played the course. He told me, uh, he said, I, I played the, the the Augusta course. And I said, he said, would you like me to come on and talk about it? And we said, of course. So we'll have uh, Seamus on May 17th. Maybe I bless it May 3rd. We'll see. Uh, keep it, we'll keep you posted. I want to thank my uh, well, lovely wife, Sharon, for putting up with this nonsense. Thank, thank you, Miguel, for making Tuesday nights so gosh on fun. Exactly. And Greg, I appreciate your putting up with the technical difficulties. But it's kind of tradition at this point. <laughs> Uh, give a shout out to Linda, who has, who has been busy saving lives in the ER and actually doing some ER training today. The poor thing. Uh, actually, that, and also, well, how could I forget? If you want to listen to the show, like I said, this whole podcast has been, like I said, it's been a roller coaster ride of emotions. But uh, if you want to listen to the show, we're on all the usual places: uh, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play. Amazon Music, Deezer, Radio Public. Go to the kneejerks.net. You will find all the links to everything we talked about here. In the Ashbury also just download MP3 from there and do what you, what you will. As Greg said, we are on uh, Facebook and we are on Twitter. I think that about covers. I guess uh, next time, Greg, we'll have a lot. We'll have NFL draft to talk about. We'll have more Tigers baseball to talk about, and I'm sure we'll think of other things to rant and rave about. So, but until that time. I think that about covers it. So we'll see you in a couple weeks. So until that time, this is Al Beaton saying good evening, good luck, and aloha. Ciao, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks.